Hey guys, uh, another inbox of you. This time a very iconic bomber of the Second World War, the Avro Lancaster, but not the usual version of Avro Lancaster. This one is a B2, which was supplanted with Bristol Hercules engines, uh, due to the fact that the um, Merlin engine at the time of production of this was actually in high demand with being supplied for Spitfires and Mosquitoes at the time. Uh, so, yeah, it had its advantages and disadvantages, but what I'm going to do is actually read out the history sheet on this one for you, because I don't really know a lot about the B-2 variant. Uh, but as I say, it was one of the most iconic aircraft of the Second World War, um, developed from the earlier um, Avro Manchester, which I wish Airfix or somebody would bring out an injection moulded form, uh, because it is an essential part of the history of the Lancaster, so... Yeah, at some stage I'm hoping that somebody's going to bring out a um, injection moulded version of the <coughs> Arrow Manchester. Um, but obviously, as we all know, um, that had reliability issues with the engines. Um, and it wasn't that successful when it first entered service around about 1941. So... They upped the length of the fuselage and the wings, put extra engines on it and supplanted it with Royal Swiss Merlins and hence the name Lancaster was born and say no more. Uh, as we all well know, the most famous raid they ever used the Lancaster in was the Dan Buster's raid whereby they actually used the bouncing bomb designed by Barnes Wallace, um, which ended up... Um, uh, breaching the Mona and Eda dams during the raid, although they weren't very successful with the Sorpe raid uh, because the bomb just bounced off, so it didn't really make any effect on that. Um, but it went on uh, to solder on during the rest of the Second World War. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, obviously it replaced the earlier bombers used during the earlier part of the years, uh, which were the Whitley, the Hamden, and obviously the Wellington. Uh, but uh, yeah, and this was basically supplied to most of the Canadian units during the in Bomber Command um, or New Zealand squadrons, I think, um, mainly up in the north. Um, and uh, in Cambridge, but so I'll, as I say, I'll read out the history sheet on you. This kit itself was first released, I think, around about 2012, um, along with the Dan Buster version, which, funny enough, I've also got that one in my stash as well, so I'll probably review that one at a later stage. <coughs> uh, but uh, we'll, we'll look into that later. Um, but for now, we'll just concern ourselves with the B2 variant. The reason I bought this is because obviously it's a lesser well known version of the Lancaster, and I think Airfix are the only ones who have ever brought it out in injection molded form. So they reissued it uh, last year, the latter part of last year. So I thought, right, I'm going to grab one, and I did. So hence why we're doing this inbox review. <laughs> Um, again, lovely bo box art illustration, as you can see on the front there, of a Lank 2 coming in from an overnight raid. Um, in the back there, you've got the uh, rest of the squadron, um, and then you've got the fuel bows going in to refuel it, replenish it for the next night's raid. And I think this is typical <coughs> seen at Linton on Ooze uh, during 1944, uh, around about winter 44. So there you go. Anyway, without further ado, we'll get on with the inbox review. As you can see, you've got two colour options as well. And the kit number, if you want to get hold of one, is, I'll bring it to the camera, A08001. That's A08001. Um, again, on the side here, you've got a little bit of information uh, about the warnings on there, all in about eight different languages. Again, box art illustration on the side, and then if you turn the box up on this side, you've got your two colour options, as you can see there. All right, and then obviously a list down here of all the Humbro colours that you could use with it if you want to use Humbro, although I've long since moved on from them, so I'll probably use Tamiya or um, Mr. Hobby. Aqueous. Uh, right, this is a devil of a box to open because so, it's quite sturdy, as you can hear. Um, 
much of a kit like this you need it to be. Um, so I'm just going to pop that down the side here. As you can see, it comes with one big bag of sprues, as you can see there. And I've just remembered I've left my scissors in the next room. So if you will bear with me, I'm going to go and get them. Back in two secs. Guys, I'm back. Sorry about that. Prepared as always for a video. <laughs> Not. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see in the background, but it is actually snowing here. Um, not heavily, but it's snowing. So, mm. and it's pretty cold. I think it's about minus one at the moment. So there you go. Anyway, I'm nice and warm and snug in here. Anyway, let's pop the decals down the side here. And then you've got your pamphlet, um, paper and instruction manual, as is always the case with Airfix kits that have been re and rebooted. A uh, little bit of history about the actual aircraft, which I'm going to read now. Um, so let's go ahead. Without further ado, we'll go ahead with this. Of the RF bombers involved in operations over Germany during World War II, the Admiral Lancaster must rank as the most famous of them all. Designed by Roy Chadwick, the Langster actually stemmed from the twin engine Arrow Manchester, which had a short service career plagued by engine prop woes and generally unreliable. However, the addition of two extra Rolls Royce Merlin engines and enlargement of the airframe, uh, the legend of the Lancaster was born. Although the Merlin is the most um, usual power plant for the Lancaster, not all produced using these engines due to the demands put on Rolls Royce by production of aircraft such as the Super Instrument Fondy, Havana Mosquito, there loomed a potential shortage of the vital engines. So the B2 variant was equipped with Bristol Hercules radial engines instead of <clears throat> instead. The first of which was completed in September 1942. These air-cooled engines did have some advantages over the inline Merlin, but also had some disadvantages, most notably in areas such as service sealing of a fully loaded aeroplane. While the Merlin-powered aircraft could operate at altitudes of 30,000 feet, the Hercules aircraft often flew at 20,000 feet, thus placing them below the other bombers, a dangerous place to be doing a raid a raid. However, the engine did enable the B2 to have a complex rate of climb to 18,000 feet, and once it was there, having a similar cruising speed to the B, uh, B3 and B1. The B2 also featured a bulge bomb bay doors uh, as standard, enabling the aircraft to carry 8,000 pound bombs. Another advantage over the B standard Lancaster was the widespread use of ventral turrets as the B-2s owing in to the lack of the H-2S radar. These turrets were useful during the winter of 1943-44 due to the more widespread use of German, um, what's that say? Shrek music weapon system, which was music weapon system, sorry, which uh, preyed upon the undefended undersides of RF bombers. Now, I'm surprised they never caught on with this, to be honest with you guys, because they went back to the Norway H2S on the Lank B3s and uh, B9s, which were produced in Canada, and they didn't think of leaving it there. So that's why a lot of these Lanks were lost, because they used to shoot up into the Bombay and the tanks. Now, if they'd had that turret there, I'm sure the losses would have been a lot less. But there you go. That's the benefit of hindsight. Anyway, get back to this. The majority of the 300 Lancaster B2s were operated by the Royal Canadian Air Force Squadrons, the majority of which had previously operated the Vickers Wellington or Handy Page Hamden, also with radial engines, thus enabling the ground crew to transition to the new machines easily. The final B-2 variant uh, rolled off the production line in March 1945 with the supply of Merlin engines strong and any danger of a shortage of the B-2 uh, 
to be to have passed phased out frontline service by the end of 1944 and declared obsolete by may 1945 the b2 had served both the rf and the rcaf well participating in crucial battles over berlin hamburg and the Ruhr. And whilst its losses were heavy with 60 percent being lost on operations the um B-2 uh, was known for being a tough aircraft, its engines especially able to soak up more damage than the Merlin. While not as famous as the Merlin power of their com contemporaries, the B-2 still deserves its place in history as the viable and capable alternative. Now, I was surprised they actually um, did that because I thought there was one or two that still were left to use and research and stuff. But, oh well, there you go. Um, so that's the history, and then obviously inside the man fleet you've got various assembly instruction indicators and so forth. Um, and then you've got your little markers indicating what you should do. Um, and then obviously we're opening up into the main assembly itself. Now I'm surprised they haven't actually got a book on the sprue trees in this, like they do with most kits, but there you go. Right. Pop that down there a minute. Obviously, the first thing that you look at is, believe it or not, the bomb bay. Um, so you fit the two bulkheads either side. Then you put the main wing spars in. Obviously, looking at the correct dihedral of 90 degrees. Next is the assembly of what looks like the pilot seat. And obviously going on to the actual lower part of the flooring there. And then adding the pilot, if you so wish. And then adding the control yoke, and then adding the actual uh, seat and seat base to the bomb bay. And then obviously adding the flight control um, manual, uh, manual, and then adding that onto the um, fuselage bomb bay, etc. And then obviously you've got a colour guide here for painting. Because obviously it was partly dark, air, dark aircraft green in the bomb bay and the actual uh, bomb engine section was all black. And then obviously you put the interior glass in, as you can see there. Fit the wing spars and the main bomb bay and internals onto the right side of the fuselage. Adding the bomb site into it as well in the bomb bay section. And then obviously you've got the flight, uh, the navigators section there, which you've got the bulkhead, etc. on the radio. Even a little transfer of a map there, as you can see. And then you've got the wireless operator section with the bulkhead there. Fit those two together. And I don't know what this means, but I'm not quite sure. I think you've got to cut something off for it to fit. So, yeah, there you go. Then you fit in the uh, wireless operator, the bomber, uh, bomber. The navigator section um, just behind the, uh, or is it the wireless operator section, just behind the pilot. Um, and then obviously you've got the little section here which actually squares that off because that's obviously where the H2S would have normally gone, but that's for the turret, ventral turret, I would assume. Um, and then the right side, you've got a decal for the um, engineer station, as you can see there, and his seat. Uh, mind you, he only sat down during takeoff and was standing most of the time during the flight there and back. And then obviously you put the left side of the fuselage together, button that up. And then you've got various bulkheads which go in for the undercarriage bay, as you can see there. Because obviously since they rebooted the length, they've got a lot more detail here. And if you've been watching Fred, um, gosh, what's his name? Foot, uh, his videos, he's actually building, I think, a B3 at the moment. Um, so yeah, following that, and he's doing a grand job of it actually. So nice, nice work, Fred. Nice work indeed, mate. Um, and then obviously you've got the rear, um, bulkheads, which go on either side of the fuselage, uh, containment. Then the upper wing goes on, as you can see here. Um, then you've got the color guide to the internal fittings of the actual undercarriage bay. Okay. etc. And then fit the landing light in, and also the lower part of the wing goes on as well as well on the other side. And then it's the fitment of the rear elevators, as you can see there. They go onto the rear um, section of the fuselage. 
Then the engine bays, outer engine bays, air coolant ducts, uh, which is part of the um, Hercules engine. That fits underneath there with the overhead air scoop. Okay, and then, oh, correct that snow is starting to really settle out there now. Um, more engine blocks, and then you've got the main one there. And uh, you put the interior bulkhead in for the undercarriage bay. Nice detail there. Air scoop again is assembled and put on the uh, upper part of the engine and then the lower part of the air scoop as well. Fit them onto the lower wing. Outer ones go on the upper wing, uh, lower wing as well, as you can see there. And then obviously with the undercarriage bays, you've got the option of having them shut or not. And then obviously you'd have to cut that through to go do so if you want the undercarriage bays open. And obviously you've got the option of getting that into flight mode if you want to. Um, undercarriage bays are down. You've got the main undercarriage block which goes into the undercarriage bays as you can see there. Slightly different design to the normal Merlin engine power plants. And then the rear part of the strut that goes in as well. And other parts of the strut, the main actual main gear as you can see there. Once that done, and the undercarriage bay doors go on. And obviously there's a sort of guide to the dihedra of how they should be sitting. And then you're going into the air brakes and um, elevators, which you can see there, which go down. You can have them down or up. So that's a good option, which you didn't get on the old kits. Um, as you can see there. Okay, and then it's the fitment of some of the engine covers, which you can see here, because obviously I used to work on these babies. Um, so they go on. And then obviously you've got the fitment of the tail planes. Okay. And then they're fitted onto the rear elevators, as it were. <coughs> Next stage is to fit the bulge bomb bay. Now, obviously, again, you've got the option of having it shut or open. As you can see there and then you've got the fitment of all where the uh, bomb bay cradles go in to fit the bomb load as you can see there obviously it depends on which one you're doing it says bomb loads to suit this model are available in separate a50 a05330 bomber resupply set now i want to get hold of that um as well because i might use this for the basis of a diorama so there you go. Um, then obviously your engine bone bays go on with the lever doors in, as it were. Okay, as you can see there, the lever doors go in for the bomb bay, and then you fit the actual bomb bay doors in, etc. Then the fitment of the rear tail um, wheel, as you can see there. And part of the icing system, I think that was the de-icing system, I'm not sure. And then obviously the wheels, which are actually flattened to give you the sense of weight, go on. And then obviously the glass for the Bombay uh, goes on, as you can see there, especially the observation dome. Uh, next process is, I think we're coming towards the end of this instruction manual now. Bear with me. Next page is the rear turret, or as we always be known, Tell and Charlie. Um, and obviously you've got the fitment of the machine guns, which you can see there, the Browning machine guns. Then the lower ventral turret. And then obviously you've got the front nose turret as well. And as you can see here, <clears throat> you've got part of the bomb bulge bomb bay, which must have been where the actual ammunition pack was held. And then the eventual turret goes underneath. Now, as I say, why they didn't keep this on the Lancasters, I don't know. Uh, maybe it was to do with the aerodynamics and the fitment of the H2S. I don't know. But if they had left the ventral turret under there, they would have had a lot less losses. Uh, that I'm pretty sure. Then you've got the uh, assembly of the mid-upper turret, which you can see here. Nose turret goes on. Glass goes on. Turret is fitted in along with I don't know what that is, but there you go. And then you've got the radar loop which goes in, observation dome goes in for the navigator, and then obviously you've got the fitment of the main canopy frame which you've got there. 
and then I think this is part of the actual um, outer frame for the front turret which goes on as well and then the final processes are the assembly of the Hercules engines which you can see here along with the propeller hub um, cowlings go on etc um, obviously you put the main engines on first before you assemble the cowlings onto the actual engine the radiator um, exhaust grills go on and then that pretty much is your Lancaster bomber built and obviously you've got the option of actually getting the stand separately if you want to keep it on the stand and then that's it and then just the rear uh, rudder pedals or whatever they are go on there and that's the assembly of your Lancaster now the good thing is with the colour cut, colour chart and colour options, they've given you a, a sort of a cellophane, well, separate sheet as a colour guide. So the first option is obviously the one that's on the box art, so Zombie of 4-8 Goose Squadron, 6 Group, Royal Canadian Air Force, Royal Air Force Linton on News, Yorkshire, July 1944, which sadly has just recently been closed. And then obviously the second option is for another one called Fanny Firkin the Second. Oh, Cracky what a name. <laughs> 514 Squadron, 3 Group, Royal Air Force, Water Beach, Cambridgeshire, November 1944. And that's your colour options. So there you go. Quite comprehensive. Now, the main crux of the matter, the kit parts themselves. Now what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to cut the actual bag to get in and I've cut the wrong one, that's it, get the sprues out, so just bear with me, I'm going to take the sprues out one or two at a time, I think we've got, hang on, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, five sprues plus one clear sprue, so it's about six sprues all together. So what I'm going to do first is the wings, the upper wings and fuselage, right hand side, if I can get it out of the bag. There we go, bear with me guys. And here we are, look at that lovely, lovely detail. Beautifully crisp, nice panel line detail as you can see there on the main fuselage. Lovely surface detail on the upper wings. Nice, crisp and clear. Again, also with the actual uh, tail. Oh, hang on, if I can get this to go into... When you look at the tail planes, there's some nice detail here, especially with the rudder pedal, rudder and the self-assemblies there. Beautifully reproduced. Tail planes are beautifully reproduced as well. Nice crisp clear uh, sprues. And then you've got the detailed bomber bay there. That's lovely. Your tyres, which are weighted, as you can see there, which is a nice touch. Um, pretty impressive with this, to be honest with you guys. I think I've reviewed one of these in the past, but uh, again, very, very impressive. Well, that's the first sprue. And we'll look at the opposite side because we can see the interior detail as well. And there is some nice interior framework detail, which you can see here. And obviously you've got the engineer station here, uh, where all the vessels go for the actual temperature of the oil and fuel supply, etc., which you could read, etc. Um, again, in the bomb bay itself, it's nicely detailed. Or the, uh, the bomb aimer section, very nicely done. Beautiful detail. Um, I really love it. Um, again, you've got the main, one of the main spars there. And um, obviously the other tyre as well. And again, on here, this I think is the bulkheads which go in the internal workings of the bomb bay. And if I turn it around the other side, you can see again on here all the lovely detail there is beautifully reproduced i love it so there you go i can't wait to build this actually when i get around to building it um next section 
is obviously the engine they sell of the Hercules engines, which you can see here. Again, nice little rivet detail on here. Beautifully reproduced. Um, the air scoops are here for the Bristol Hercules engines. And then you obviously got the workings of the actual Bristol Hercules here. You know, the magneto heads, etc. Beautifully done. Beautifully reproduced. That should come out nicely with a wash. And again, you've got the engine they sell. Nice level of uh, detail on those as well. Um, I'm not sure. I think these are part of the uh, assembly for the propeller hubs, which you've got here. And again, with the front engine covers, there is nice level of detail with the rivets on it as well. Beautifully done, crisp and clear. Even the props are beautifully reproduced as well. So yeah, I'm really impressed with this. Awesome. I'll tell you what, Airfix are certainly basically up in their game. And then obviously you've got the familiar Biowatch Bombay of the B2, which you can see here. Nicely done. Oops, you must have part off the screw then. I've got to be careful with these. And the next one is obviously the actual Bombay's uh, doors themselves. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of mold seam mold uh mold seam marks there but you can easily get rid of them with a sander so that's not a problem uh under carriage bay units where you got there and then obviously you've got the cradles for the bombs the bomb load as well um and there's a little bit of detail here with the pilot i think that's the only crew member they've got in this kit um so you can put him in if you should so wish but it's a standard sort of figure that you get with the airfix kit um and then obviously you've got some of the workings of the undercarriage which you can see here again very nice level of detail on here guys beautifully reproduced so yeah a bit fiddly i should imagine but there you go um but very nicely done indeed so there you go all right and obviously then we've got some of the elevators which you can see here for the flaps Nice level of detail on the internal workings here. I like that touch. Um, and then obviously you've got sub-assemblies for some of the bulkheads and obviously the gun mounts. And then obviously you've got your brown and machine guns here. Again, nice level of detail on these as well, chaps. Little bit bent, but again, you can put them in warm water and soon rectify that. That's not a problem. And then obviously you've got some of the actual bulkheads for the undercarriage bay assembly as well very nice very nice again look at the detail on these bulkheads and this is for the engine bl uh, blocks i think or is it the in no it's the internal workings of the undercarriage bay but again you've got lovely detail on all the wires etc beautifully reproduced and uh, it's very well done for one seventy second scale i must admit um, and then obviously you've got the main control panel here, which is own, unfortunately not very detailed. You've got to put a deck all over that. So that's a little bit of a downturn on that. But again, you can get some aftermarket just to enhance that. So that's not a problem. And then finally, you've got your main clear parts. Now, I'm not going to take this out of the bag because I don't want to lose any of them. So, but again, nice clear detail, especially on the actual canopy, which you can see here. There's your H2S, which obviously is for a B2. Um, observation dome. And then obviously you've got your rear turret here, uh, mid-upper, and also your nose turret, which is nice. And obviously with these, apparently on some versions of the B2, they had blisters on the side and some didn't according to Fred, so uh, yeah, I'd have to do some research on that. And then you've got two, believe it or not, um, observation domes for the bomb aimer, which, hmm, I'm not quite sure. That one does seem a little bit different from the other, so that's obviously for a B3. And then the side glass panels for the fuselage. And then on here, you've got your landing lights as well. So yeah, very nice, guys. I really love this kit. Um, I'm just going to put the screws back in the bag for a minute. I mean, the level of detail, I have to say, is superb. I mean, if you want to add more to it, you can. Um, 
but you wouldn't need a lot of alpha market for this to be honest to enhance the cockpit maybe just um, seat harnesses for the pilot that's all uh, maybe a edge brass column for the main control panel uh, but not a lot really to be honest with you to make this a good reproduction of the V2 right I'm just going to pop them in there Put screws back in that's that and obviously the instruction manual and then finally we'll have a look at the decals I'm just going to put that back in there that's going to go in there and let's have a look at the decals I think these are done by Cartograph so there shouldn't be any problems with getting them down nice colour definition not too shiny so this should bear down well I love this box I love this illustration here for Zed Zombie and there's obviously Fanny Verk in the second so oops hang on let's put that in the light you can see that and obviously you've got all the um, my markings. And obviously right here, as you can see, you've got the navigator's map there as well. So that's a nice touch. And obviously you've got the wireless operator's um, part there as well. I think some radio, etc. And the navigator station. So very nicely reproduced. They should go down beautifully. So yeah, very impressed with Airfix on their uh, new releases just lately. They really have got their, <coughs> they really have up their game. So yeah, if you can get hold of any one of these lengths of theirs, do so. Uh, I know they keep reissuing them, um, but if you want to get a B2, which is a unique version of the length, I would heartily recommend you do. I'm not quite sure how long they're going to have these on the market, so hence why I snapped one up. Um, I would love it if they did a Manchester and love it if they brought out a Lincoln as well. Um, so there you go, Airfix. There's a suggestion for you. Avro Manchester we need, and we need an Avro Lincoln as well. So there you go. Or even an Avro York. That would be another suggestion. Anyway that may be another sort of thing they may do in the future who knows uh but that's it for now guys i've just done it well this is just over half an hour now this has taken so fantastic looking kits i heartily recommend if you want to get hold of a fantastic kit of a lancaster 170 second go for an airfix one definitely anyway that's it for now guys so until the next time get kit crazy happy modeling and i will speak to you again soon